Hi, everyone. I'm Nick Maida, and I'm excited to have our next session of Metaphysical Musings, where we got to talk to leaders in SaaS about what they're doing, doing to drive durable growth in their businesses. So with me today, I'm excited to welcome Andre Albuquerque, who's the Vice President of Product and founding team member at Kitsch. Andre is also the founder of One Month PM, a PM Accelerator program, and an invited professor at Catholic, Catholica Lisbon. Um, I have to say, I should be doing more stuff on the side. I'm very impressed with all your side 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 gigs here. It's safe to say, Andre is a full of wisdom for product professionals. Really excited to have you here. Welcome. Thank you very much, Nick. It's a pleasure. Appreciate the invite. Looking forward for this conversation. Awesome. Well, we're both passionate about products. So, but before we dive into that, um, you obviously have passions outside of work. So, what's if you think about just your 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 day to day life? What's the one app you can't live without? Yeah, so I, I think first, I don't think I'm ever not working. Uh, I might not be sitting in the computer, but I'm always thinking whether yeah. how to make Kitsch grow faster or my team more successful or how to grow one month PM uh, or my classes better. So um, given this, I think it's really enough, but I'm going to say it's a Microsoft app. I wasn't expecting this in huh. 2022. Wow. Yeah, um, so it's, it's to do, Microsoft to do, which is previously Wonderlist. Oh, they bought Wonderlist. They bought right. Wonderlist, yeah. yeah. So, which shows the power of well-executed M&A. Uh, yeah. So, and and what, like to do is my personal assistant. Uh, at any point, I have a thought uh, that requires some action, turns into a to do. So it's always there, like front screen. Um, and anything that isn't there, honestly, doesn't get done. So I'd say if I had to choose one app outside in work, everything, uh, yeah, I would choose that. Weirdly, I, I never thought that it was a Microsoft app. I was. There so you I go. Think. Microsoft people listening, you should be proud. That's you bought a good company. So I actually need to check that out. I'm still using the Apple reminders. I could probably upgrade to something a little more, a little more modern by mine, by the way. So I'm going to seem much less serious because mine is a shopping app called Yux, Y-O-O-X, which has great, great fashion deals at any given time. So, so, so we have maybe different things we do outside of work, but one of the things we're both really passionate about is product management. I started my career way, way back when in product management. It's evolved so much, particularly with the world of SaaS and cloud. I'd love to hear your journey of how you got into product management. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's a bit like most PMs. It's accidental. Um, yeah. I think I fell into the role. Uh, I didn't know what product was. I just knew I I got a kick out of solving problems, uh, especially using technology. And uh, I think software and building product was a way to solve at scale. Um, I think like since young, I wanted to build stuff. I started with architecture, then realized this wasn't it, uh, dropped it, uh, then went through management, knew I had to build technology, asked myself what was the best way to learn. Google was usually the re reference, so I got into Google. Uh, and I thought like, yeah, startups, growth, this is what I really enjoy and love. And then uh, again, I was continued building product uh, in my growth role. And it said, maybe I should go into product management. And I fell into that role. So I think it's very it's very similar to majority of, of PMs that kind of getting there without actually knowing what it is. Yeah, it's a, I, I totally agree with you, by the way. I think most people end up in the role and people think that there's one career path to get in, but you actually look at most people in product, they've come from so many different backgrounds, but there is a common passion for making things better and you know, and and uh, using data and things like that. So maybe good segue. You've done a great job just writing a lot. One of the things I love that you, you wrote these ten lessons of your career. Uh, and you number four was a pretty good pithy one, which is there's always a way. There's always another way. And so you know, right now I think that's very valuable because everyone is dealing with a lot of stuff right now. You've got you know potential recession. You've got a downturn in the valuation of tech companies. Inflation. Um, you know, obviously we're still coming off the great, great resignation. Maybe there's other stuff coming. So people are dealing with a lot of uncertainty. How does, um, how would you coach a company through dealing with this uncertainty right now? So I think, uh, I think that, that number four is, uh, I think it's a, it's a great lesson, at least for me, like the, there's always another way. Um, yeah. it's, I think it's like the ultimate product manager mindset, right? Totally. Uh, when we deal with uh, designers, engineers, stakeholders, I think everyone thinks they know the way, which <laughs> means immediately there's multiple ways because rarely they're all same way of thinking or right. they think the same way. Um, so I think, I think if there's a lot of ways to solve a problem, then 
looking at the recession, looking at the downturn, looking at the new reality economically means that you got to have uh, new ways, different ways of thinking about problems. And uh, I think the, the PM role where I come from is, is all about that right combination of what's the right way with the timeline, the right timeline and with the right resources, right? And I think that is for me the answer, the way I would coach uh, anyone going towards this market is, um, yeah, there's always another way. I think that's the, the mindset, um, especially for people who've been thinking, oh, there's no other way or I'm stuck with this option. Yeah. Uh, I think you should always go for that. And then it's it's about resilience. I think resilience wise, uh, it's, it's yeah, it's it's mindset, right? I don't want to go too long, but I think it's, yeah, it's mine. This is how I would coach. I love it. No, it's great. And you know, one of the things you, you do a lot of uh, great work on is high level advice like that, but then getting a little bit more specific and tactical, so one of the things I saw you wrote, which is very relevant to everyone, is just like best practices and worst practices in road mapping. What are the red flags to avoid in building a roadmap? Obviously, every product manager, that's one of the things that you do. And you know, I think especially in SaaS, the, the whole concept of roadmaps change a lot because we have you know continuous integration, continuous delivery, agile, all those kinds of things, which change the world of like before when you have a three-year roadmap and it's fixed. So when you talk to people, what are some of the red flags you tell them to avoid in building a roadmap? Yeah, I, I wrote a post with, with about 10 flags. Um, I think I, I, highlighting a few uh, as a way of answering like, yeah, keep away from these or improve this would technically be a great answer. So I'd say um, I'd highlight maybe uh, roadmaps that focus a lot on features. Um, yeah. Or worse, that, that only talk about building stuff, building features is definitely a broken roadmap. Um, I think the, the transition or the focus should be more around where you want to get, the outcomes, the objectives, what are the yep. problems that keep you from getting there and what opportunities can you uh, prioritize out of these problems? And then you jump into the solutions and the execution. All of this will actually get you a better I, I love that. But just to pause on that one, that's such so relevant now because obviously people buy software to get an outcome, to get a business value. And still so many roadmaps, including some at Gainsight, all of us have the same problem where it is a bunch of features and the product manager loses sight of the outcome. So I, I really like that one. No, yeah, it's it's true. And I actually wrote a post about an opposite approach because I, even though the theory is there around like how to build better roadmaps, a lot of people, a lot of teams still start solutions first. They do. Think, totally. Oh, this is my idea or yeah. worse, they're in a company where road mapping is almost like a shopping list from yeah. executives that just ask you to build X, Y, and Z. Um, <laughs> and, and it's like, yeah, it's changing the approach is definitely one. I think another one is um, when you just work really hard building a roadmap and just a couple of weeks later, you're tweaking it. You're already yeah. changing it. And this is like, you need to be confident, especially going into a new market like this. You need to be confident about your decisions. In the end of the day, uh, in panic mode, which is what this market is kind of driving people. Um, a lot of people will doubt decisions and running roadmaps is like, no doubt. Uh, there's a, a great saying, like, if there's doubt, there's no doubt. And this doubt, if, if you're doubting it, it's on you. So you're not the right leader. The last one is like, I think uh, if you don't reflect, if you don't learn from what you ship in the last quarter or last month or last six months, um, you're losing so much data, so much input into what you should be building. Um, then you're just like shipping and moving onwards and, and, and not really caring about the process of learning. So I'd say like, if this is your reality, I would definitely work on it. Um, so yeah, this were my, I would say, highlight. Great, between great one. So we, you talked about outcomes, not just features. You talked about not just changing the roadmap willy nilly and then making sure you have some reflection. I think those are all really, really relevant, particularly in the world of enterprise SaaS where there's just, you know, the roadmap is so important. But, you know, one of the things I think that's also true in SaaS is the product manager isn't just working the roadmap. They're not just working with engineering. They wear a ton of different hats. And you actually wrote a good blog post on this one, which is it's 100% true. So just maybe making it personal for a second. What, as a product person, what hat do you love to wear? Like, what's the one you really have fun with? And then if you looked at the current world and the current business climate, what's the one that PMs need to get good at wearing, even if they don't love it? Yeah, so I had fun re uh, writing that because uh, I got to reflect on all the different things I end up doing as a PM, yeah. as well as a, a product leader. Um, I'm going to split maybe this answer between my favorite hats and maybe the one uh, PMs will really need to 
where, given where the market's going. Right. I, I'd say my favorite hat's a bit of a, a, a weird one, which is the mayor hat, which is oh. the one that I, I say that uh, you got to wear a hat of someone rallying the village, like your team or the group, yep. Yorick. Um, you got to get them energized, hopeful. I think you know, in a time like this, it's like getting them hopeful is, is a bit of an unofficial job of a product manager or a product leader. Um, can I... I, I I think the mayor hat also gives you kind of the power to convince your team to build the unsexy things that yeah, get yeah. us to the sexy vision, right? There's so much piping and plumbing to be built to get there. Uh, and I think this hat is one of my favorites because it's something I, I, I really love to do. Love um, in terms of, of hats, I, I, I believe PMs or anyone has to wear important hats to wearing this uncertainty. I think, um, I think the, the, the product leader's hat is definitely the coach hat. Um, definitely the coach hat. It's all, it's all about leverage. It's all about knowing how to coach people, especially you asked the question around like, what uh, would be my recommendations around coaching, right? Um, if, example, like if I'm wearing the coach hat right now as a product leader, there's like one, two, three, I definitely recommend. I think number one is like, be realistic that things change. Yeah. Uh, never sugarcoat reality. That's what the, sh the, the coach hat would tell you. Second thing is like, Prepare. I love a quote from Chris Voss uh, from the book, Never Split the, the Middle. It says, like, you fall to your level of preparation. Right. Uh, and, and the third is, like, challenge the principles. And if and reality is like, oh, you've always been like this. But if you challenge principles, you can bend reality. Right. So these are, like, the three principles of, like, wearing the coach hat. Um, if I was recommending to a, a PM, on what is like the most important hat you need to wear. I'd say the union leader hat. I think my, my post would make these more contextual, but like the union leader is where you represent your users like a union leader does for so their cool. people. I love that. Uh, I usually say like people uh, will vote with their wallets. And uh, I think in this situation where people are reassessing their choices and decisions, especially around software, they will vote with their wallet. And if they don't feel represented by your company's decisions, they'll churn on you. So yeah, this is my recommendation around that. Those are, so, I love the metaphors because we can easily use much more functional language, but I think it makes it very, very visceral to talk about the mayor, the union leader, you know, and it's it, it, one of the things that we talked about in some of the prep docs is just the idea that part of product management fundamentally using your mayor analogy is, you're leading, but you don't always control everything, right? You don't control the engineers directly. And so you've got to lead by example. And you got to show people what great is. And you wrote a good post about this. So what do you think? Like, I think I've struggled with that one too. Like, how do you define what great is for your team? Like, what does great look for you? Look like for you? How do you make sure you're not expecting too much and not being unreasonable? Like, how do you think about what great means for you? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, I think I had a manager once telling me, uh, to cook great food, you got to have tasted great food. Yeah. I think it's a great analogy. Uh, really you know, we're, we're lucky that we get to taste what great looks like in terms of products. We get to use amazing products on our daily basis, built from some of the most performing, amazing teams in the world. Um, so I think learning, dissecting how these teams build these products is a great way of us tasting the food so that we can then build the food. I think every company has patterns that make them great. Uh, some companies are amazing on their engineering orgs. Others have amazing re research processes. Uh, others have great brands or messaging that keeps us excited about the products and reflect right. on the products. So I think learning from them what makes them great gets you into a place where maybe great can uh, rise from your own execution. Uh, and then it's this, this execution. I think Great is not just about the features you add or the quality of your product or how you use it. It's also about thinking process and execution, especially if you're a product leader. Um, I think a great process, a great execution, relationships, respect within the people that give you will give you eventually a great product. Uh, and the last, I think it's it's great comes from the top, right? Um, I love this is a great book from Ben Horowitz says that uh, what you do is who you are. It's all about yeah. culture. Yeah. So. If, if you want to aim for great, then I think one leaders need to uh, not only show what great looks like for the process they're building, but be great at the small things, at the non-obvious, like great one-on-ones, great performance reviews, great celebrations, yeah. uh, great messaging. All of these will inspire you to demand greatness 
from you. Uh, and that's how I think culture builds greatness. That's great advice. Uh, very, very good. Thank you. Um, so one of, you know, getting to the more technical side of things, you know, in product management now, there's obviously a lot of data out there. Um, and we actually do, do a report on a regular basis called the product led growth index. And we ask people, you know, do you use kind of customer experience usage data in planning your product roadmap? 57% of people said, yes, I will say, wait, what are those 43% of people doing? <laughs> what if they're not using data? So I'm curious as how you think about data as part of your road mapping process, what metrics do you look at? What do you find valuable? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of talk about data driven. Yeah. And I, I think there was an over indexation of, of, of data in roadmap. I believe right. uh, there's some, a lot of product leaders that talk about more data informed. I think data is just another input, a really important one, but uh, uh, also understanding it's, it's another input. I think right. great, great roadmaps accommodate nuance. Right, nuance means it's just—it's not just data; it's also quality feedback. It's, uh, or let's put it another way: it's—it's it's not just data, nor it's just quality feedback, nor it's just stakeholder needs, nor it's just customer needs. It's, it's a combination, a mix and match of all of these. Yeah. Uh, though I do agree, I think product experience data or the data that you get from understanding how customers are using it and flows and the funnels and all of that. It has a massive impact on your ability to make great decisions. And I think in the coming markets uh, where maybe you have a bit more strapped resources, I think that data and that decision will be even more important. Um, and I've been working more with earlier stage products where uh, you got to go for unscalable product experience data which is a lot of research, a lot of insights, yeah. almost face-to-face -face insights. Then as products grow, you get to mature that data. You get to uh, use that at scale to drive insights. Um, early on, it's it's a bit different. Uh, I would say, uh, if I thought about metrics wise. Yeah, what like metrics that. do you, which ones do you look at? Yeah, yeah, because in the end of the day, data metrics kind of come hand in hand. Um, I think it depends a bit what you're trying to move. Like every, every team has their KPIs or their North Star. Um, so it's it's all about dissecting what that KPI or that North Star uh, kind of looks like in terms of functional metrics, in terms of like, okay, what drives this to move from left yep. to right? Um, and then it's making them core and center to your strategy. Um, and then, of course, you're going to be working with other people, other stakeholders. And so it's also understanding what their KPIs are and what makes yeah. them successful, right? If there's alignment in a company, um, I believe that making stakeholders successful because they have a process to understand what matters for the company will make the company successful, will make the product successful. Um, and last, I think in terms of data, we're talking about this, I'm a huge lover of research data. And, and I love uh, Teresa Torres, uh, her book, Continuous Discovery Habits, she talks a lot about the story. The, the stories of customers, right? Yeah. And a lot of great product is about listening to that story and then reading in between the lines. That's There's a lot of hidden data there that I think earlier stage is what really defines or differentiates what the greats from the goods and the mediocres. I love that. that and that story of the, the customer, the user, the persona is something I think a lot of product managers don't have. Um, and they they don't, and it's it's hard for them to even make sense of the data without the story as, as you were just talking about. Yeah, exactly. So, what, one, one of the, it's hard, hard to do a discussion of product in 2022 without using the number one buzzword, which is product-led growth. Uh, product-led growth is obviously very hot in terms of concept. What are you seeing in terms of reality, in terms of product managers getting involved in acquisition and expansion and, you know, the commercial side of the business? I think, um, yeah, there, there's a problem with the hype, right? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, if there's right. high people have a bit of FOMO of like, oh, I'm not doing, therefore I need to do it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I should be doing it. And I, I think like, uh, I think it depends, right? Uh, a lot of markets, industries and customers, type of customers can work with product led growth, but there's yeah. a lot of others that can't, that yeah. need either need handholding or need a sales driven organization. So I think it depends a lot, like just going after the hype because you believe you need to have when maybe the market doesn't want you to have um, is, is a problem right now. Though, honestly, um, I think not 
trying or aiming to incorporate some product-led growth principles within your acquisition flows. If you're not doing it at all, you're, you're solely relying on the sales-driven organization. I think you're setting yourself a failure as well um, because it's a question of time that someone will figure that out. And if it's right. not you, someone will. Um, so I think it's- And I it's, think that what you're saying there is it's not an on-off thing. Like you exactly. can incorporate elements of product-led growth, whether it's the way people get a demo or certain parts of the trial process without necessarily having it be an on-off switch. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's pragmatism. And I've seen a lot of companies, for example, I'm going to, I'm going to give you an example. I've seen because you mentioned expansion. So yeah. I, I see a lot of companies that rely on people for expansion, um, on upgrading, upselling, cross-selling sometimes if you're expanding your product suite and they rely on a lot of success people or account management people, whoever. And um, oftentimes what I've seen is like, if you're pre public market fit, these people aren't really being able to do that. They yeah. are focused in, in dealing with problems and catering for an almost churn or a pre-churn or totally. just making sure the basics are offered rather cross-selling or upselling. So I think if you don't expect product to be involved um, in, in that PLG or in that expansion, I think you're setting yourself a failure. And I think there's another important thing, which is, um, and, and I think this is a problem with the product world, right? Which is, I see a lot of PMs, product managers, focusing a lot on delivery of roadmaps or features. Um, yep. Maybe some already metric driven or even outcome focused, which is great. But I don't see enough of them owning actual PLs and uh, yeah. unit economics and actually being almost wearing the GM hat. We're talking mm -hmm. about hats, Another like hat. a general yeah. manager hat, right? Yeah. Um, and if people, I believe products are vehicles of value, right? You build a company and you build a product to deliver value to a customer. Uh, in the end of the day, the product only exists to generate value to the company, right? And if right. you're a PM and building it and you don't understand what our economics or value how you derive it, you don't wear that hat, then you're going to fail as a PM. So expansion and upsell is definitely the next chapter of continuous value creation, right? You need to kind of have that in mind. I love that. That's interesting too, because especially in the current economy, unit economics as a concept are becoming much more important. People want to know this will eventually make money. We had a little bit of suspension of disbelief for a few years about that. And now it's back in fashion. And that means that if your product manager understanding your customer acquisition cost, your lifetime value, your all the different things that affect your unit economics are, are really important. Well, speaking of that, so maybe one of the, the oldest buzzwords, we, we're talking about a new buzzword with product-led growth. One of the oldest buzzwords in product is product market fit. Um, and you wrote an article on that about how to assess it and how you think how to quantify it specifically. You know, net revenue retention is a metric that potentially is a lens into product market fit. Can, can, can you see if there's a connection there? Yeah. So, so the way I think is um, in a world where kind of loyalty is always at play, it's like yep. uh, it's so much easier now to find other products to solve a problem I have or a business has. Then I would say like NRR uh, is definitely the ultimate loyalty metric. Right, exactly. Either, I think it's you know, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and you mentioned like a downturn, like in a world where we're going from growth at all costs yeah. uh, to, to economics, unit economics, and NRR is going to be your true test. Yeah. Right? Um, so definitely there's some connection here. Uh, I wouldn't say maybe exactly like product market fit. I usually say that you can hack growth, but you can't hack retention, right? Yeah, Be that's people, good. Yeah, people only stay with products that really solve their problems. Uh, and if you don't, they're going to they're gonna leave. You can try to subsidize retention, but I mean, as you go up market, businesses see the opportunity cost. It's just too high. So they're going to they're gonna turn, they're going to switch for another one. Um, the only caveat I see is of NRR as, as kind of a connection to product market fit is that you can't really get into the arena before you get PMF, uh, product market fit. So I prefer to see NRR as more of a, continuous product market fit. It's like, it's a signal that you're growing with the market. So you're keeping your promise, right? Yeah. And, and I think this is going to be even more important if we think like it's, we're coming off of like 14 years of a, a bull market of a run. Right. We have most people building products and operating that maybe never seen other 
That's right. Things that are in the cool one. Exactly. Yeah. I, I almost have, I, I haven't seen it, honestly. I, I'm going to yeah. be honest. Um, so I think the, you're going to be forced to prioritize other things and change your execution. Um, so I think like thinking NRR as we go as a connection to product market fit and keeping that promise, I think it's, uh, it's the way I would think it's the connection I make. I love that. Both those concepts, you, you can't, you can't hack your way into retention and then NRR is a potential ongoing measure of, you know, product market fit. Really awesome. I will, unfortunately our time's up. So I'm just going to close that with a little, a word association. I like to do that. And just some things to see what people remember. So I'm going to say, uh, a phrase or word, and you just say the first thing that comes to mind. Um, okay. So let's start with an easy one, product management or product. What, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Uh, solving problems. Solving like problems. Product. Yeah. yeah. Product is solving problems. Yeah. Awesome. Well, my, I, after your talk though, my, the first thing that comes to mind for me is hats. I, I just see a bunch of hats, hats. now. So that's, that's the, but I like, I like that. Okay. We talked about resiliency. What comes to mind for resiliency when you, when you, uh, product market fit, you need a lot of resilience to get the product market fit. Definitely. That's right. And product market fit also gives you resilience. So there's a, there's exactly. a, it's a, a it's circular a thing there. Yeah. Okay. How about growth? Growth. Uh, luck. It's going to be weird. It's a bit contrarian. I'd say luck. I, I think a lot of people uh, believe growth comes from a method. And if you follow it, you just get growth. And it's not true. There's a lot of luck involved. There's like moments, it's flashes. Yeah. And I think I'd say luck. It's weird, but it came to mind. I don't think that's weird. I think that you talked about before too. There's a, there was an over rotation towards data and everything is auto, auto, scientific and there's some element that is uh, hard to, to quantify. So roadmap, road mapping. What's road what's mapping? Uh, tears and sweat, especially from my team who are, is an amazing team in building thoughtful plans to achieve moonshot goals, which I, I, I put in front of them. Uh, so I'd say tears and sweat from them and myself, but because yeah. I shared them. No, I think you'd I mean, honestly, if you care about it, that's probably what, what it takes. So yeah. um, leadership, you know, we have to be great leaders. What, what comes to mind for you? Uh, storytelling or inspiration. Uh, yeah. I think like humans connect with stories and yeah. true leadership makes you connect with stories and follow someone. Uh, so I'd say that. The mayor, right? That's the mayor. The mayor, yeah. exactly. The mayor, it's a great connection. Yeah. Awesome. And then last one, we talked about this concept of human first business again. So I'm not forget about the human being on the other side of that application or in your team or whatever. What does that mean to you? Table stakes. I think it's yeah. like, uh, I, I don't think we can operate anymore if we're not thinking human first and understanding that, especially as we build product, it's like there's a person behind the problem. And uh, as I said, like you can hack retention. People are resourceful uh, at, at finding new ways of solving the problem. If it's not you, they vote with their wallets. So I'd say, yeah, table stakes. There's a person behind the problem. What a great way to close. Awesome. This has been incredible. I really, really appreciate the dialogue, Andre. It's been just awesome hearing your insights. Thanks for all you do, not just for your company, but for the whole product community in general. Thank and, you very uh, much. Appreciate look forward it. Look forward to, to uh, continue dialogue. And if you want to learn more about some of the things we talked about, definitely check out our Pulse conference on August 17th and 18th in San Francisco, as well as available live stream. And we have a whole uh, kind of track all about product and being a modern product leader. Awesome. Have a great day. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Nate.